Maybe we should call maintenance. I'll fix it. I'm gonna fix it. Concentrate it. Maintain it. Maintain control. Maintenance complete. This is The Maintainers, a Blue Cap community podcast. My name is David Lee, Director at Traction, and your host for The Maintainers Show. And I'm Jake Hall, the Manufacturing Millennial. On today's episode, we're joined by Ron Moore. He's the managing partner of the RM Group, Inc. Today, you're going to hear from Ron how he started working in the industry on nuclear subs and uh, Grand uh, Connecticut and how he consults organizations across the world on reliability. Uh, but before we kick off today's episode, let's hear a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Traction. Traction offers streamlined hardware and software solutions designed to make maintenance more reliable and profitable. Their AI-powered condition monitoring and asset management solution predicts machine failures and eliminates unplanned downtime, generating an average of 38% more productivity for clients worldwide. It's artificial intelligence quarterbacking your maintenance. Well, thanks for joining us today, Ron. First off, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Oh, fine. Glad to be here. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you guys and share my thoughts about reliability. Now, before we get into reliability, you've been in the industry for a long time. So we want to know, where is your escape when you're getting burnt out? Where do you like to be? Where do you like to travel to? Where is your place of escape? Well, I don't recall the last time I was burned out. I've, I've always enjoyed work and, you know, you get tired occasionally, but burned out, eh, I can't really relate to that at this point in my life. Uh, well, my wife and I like to go to uh, Florence, to Tuscany. That's, my, that's our very favorite place in the world to visit. And if you haven't been there, I would encourage you to go see the architecture, the medieval history, the wine, the food. It's all just, you know, wonderful. You know, uh, maybe Ireland would be second choice. But when I'm home, I like to hike up in the Smoky Mountains, which are near here. And I find that to be very relaxing and pleasant and enjoyable, all that sort of thing. Awesome. You know, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned. You said that you can't relate to burnout. And there's been a lot of studies that validated this recently. Burnout is not about overwork, but it's actually about feeling the lack of impact. So obviously what you do, you know that you're impacting the globe and you're impacting your clients. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. You sound like you've, uh, you've traveled all over the world and things, and, uh, and that's wonderful. But before we dive in, to your background, I just want to say thank you for participating in the upcoming documentary, Unturning Still, presented by the team at Traction. Now, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in the industry. Okay. Uh, depends on how far you want to go back. I, I grew up, I'll give you some of that. You know, I grew up in eastern Kentucky. And in spite of the area, which isn't known for being high tech or advanced or maybe even backward, really, uh, had great teachers, great parents and so on. And from there had the good fortune to get an appointment to West Point. So I spent three years there, got kicked out as a firstie or a senior for being married, spent a couple of years in the army as a chaplain's assistant, uh, working for a bunch of priests and ministers. And then from there went back to school I got my BS, MS in mechanical engineering, MBA, PE, CMRP, you know, all the usual stuff that you might, uh, don't be too impressed by that, okay? You just got to be tenacious about applying what little <laughs> talent you have. Anyways, my first job, though, which is probably more to the point of what we're talking about here, was working on nuclear submarines. And I, I didn't really realize it at the time, but in retrospect, I look back and they had extraordinarily high standards, procedures, checklists, training, development, you know, all that sort of thing. And when you think about it, think about the reliability that's essential for a nuclear submarine. You know, if, if you're out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and you're down, you know, several hundred feet below the surface, Unplanned downtime takes on a whole new meaning in your life. Yeah. So, and, and then you throw on top of that, 
these submarines are being operated by 20-year-olds and maintained, you know, by 20- and 30-year-olds. So the standards for reliability, ease of operation, ease of maintenance, and the training and development that goes with that has to be extraordinary. So, but I only recognize that in, in retrospect, but I've, I found it to be, looking back, found it to be kind of a seminal experience. Anyways, from there, I moved uh, from Connecticut down to Knoxville, where I am now. And for the most part, I spent several years, maybe 20 years, uh, working mostly in projects, coordinating and trying to get various functional groups to work together to a common purpose. And eventually, I became the president of a company called CSI, and we made condition monitoring instruments and software technology that allowed, you know, mostly heavy industry, DuPont, BP, Weyerhaeuser, you know, Alcoa, you know, mostly big, huge industrial operations to know when their equipment needed maintenance and to know about how much time they had left and so on. But Perhaps more importantly, I learned more about how manufacturing operates work. It's not just the maintenance. There are just a plethora of issues that have to be addressed if you want to have good reliability and so-called operational excellence. And then, gosh, 30 years ago, I set out on my own, and I've been doing that ever since, working with companies around the world, mostly again in in heavy industry, with a focus not so much on condition monitoring as on high level performance of how you get the entire operation to work collectively to some sort of common purpose and objective that relates to the success of the business. So that's probably enough, you know, for now on what I do. So as as a quick follow-up question, just with me being a, a military history and I guess you could say nerd along the way. Um, What was the most surprising thing when you were working on these nuclear subs when it came to a maintenance or reliability process or procedure that just kind of was like, wow, I never thought of that until it was mentioned to me. If there's anything you can add to that. Yeah. To me, uh, the design that, you know, those steps they went through to make sure the design was correct and all the uh, what the attention to detail about the standards that were applied for, say, welding, for installation. You know, I mean, imagine putting a nuclear reactor inside a 40 foot diameter tube. You know, you got to know how to get it in and get it out. You can't just say, well, boys, what we're going to do today. You know, so the, all that was given extraordinarily detailed thought. And, of course, at the time, being a young engineer, I'm kind of irritated with it. But I'd rather to irritate me than to irritate the sailors who are trying to get the work done after the fact. So, again, it's a retrospective perspective about all the attention to detail that went to this. And and a lot of that was driven by Admiral Rickover. He set exceptionally high standards that everybody knew and knew they had to follow, and he got it most of the time. So Sounds you can great. substitute the word real something no, else. No, no, I, I love I love the authenticity there, Ron. Let's let's roll with him. You know, <laughs> so now that we know a little bit more about you, I think this is a great opportunity to jump into the first segment of the show, which is the maintainer's mashup. It's where we, where we dive deeper into equipment management, um, uh, creating structures around teams that really move maintenance and um, make it more reliable. Maintenance required. Listen, I maintain. I maintain myself. Maintain course. Maintain speed. I gotta maintain respect. So, you know, as a consultant, you know, can you give, you, you have a unique perspective on when it comes to how organizations run their maintenance and reliability practices. Can you talk more about just the stories and the insights that you have around these topics when it comes to you as a consultant and how you're supporting these companies? Well, most organizations, and you can give them credit for running it, uh, a lot of them run it poorly, 
Most of them are fairly mediocre, and a few of them are really superb. And, you know, I'd say one or two or maybe 5% are superb, and the rest of them are kind of, yeah, we're doing what we can, you know. It, it, and, and that's not because they're bad people or incompetent people. These are really fine people. They know how to do the work for the most part. But they're put in a position where the defects overwhelm their ability to actually do a superb job. And the defects are coming mostly from upstream, from poor operating practices, poor procurement, you know, focused on price instead of, you know, capability, and poor design. You know, a lot of these plants are not designed for ease of operation, ease of maintenance, and, of course, reliability. And so when you compound that effect, by the time it gets to maintenance, they don't control most of the issues related to the equipment. And, and moreover, they surely don't control a lot of the issues related to production because you've got other issues around production where you have changes in your processes, changes in your products, startup and shutdown procedures, you know, uh, raw material issues and so on. So unless you take a systems level holistic view of your production process, then maintenance has very little control over the entire, you know, system level set of issues around reliability and operational excellence. Now, having said that, they're absolutely essential for that because they have to deal with all the upstream issues which finally arrive at their feet. So you've got to have, you know, really good maintenance planning. You've got to have really good condition monitoring and so on. But if you don't address the upstream defects, well, among other things, you'll be, in a, be doing a lot of work efficiently that you shouldn't be doing at all. So it's, it's kind of that uh, systems level perspective that I rarely see. And without that, you can not have good reliability and operational excellence. You've made some really good points there. Um, one thing I've noticed is a lot of those issues that are happening upstream, they still tend to fall on the shoulders of the maintenance. Uh, at least that that's the view of the people who are actually there with them. Um, now, let's say you now have a new client, right? It sounds like you've been working with clients all across the globe, all across America, and a diversity of clients uh, where you'll, you'll have to speak to different people in the hierarchy. So let's say you enter a new company, a new plant, and you see these different issues, uh, but you don't necessarily think they're aligned correctly in what the real issue is. How do you, how do you address the situation? How would you enter? What are your steps that you would take to kind of show them and point them in the right direction uh, as you being the expert and getting them to basically listen to you and see what you're seeing? Well, it kind of depends on where I go in. You know, if I go in at a plant level, what, what the site manager cares about is, is production on quality production on time in full at the lowest sustainable cost. And so I try to speak to that issue on how that can be addressed with some of the things I've observed in the plant. Now the guy, his boss, the VP of operations, or maybe even the CEO, and I've done a few of these for CEOs of, you know, really big companies, you know, part of the fortune not just Fortune 500, Dow Jones, industrial average. In any event, what they care about is the money, okay? So in one instance, one of these companies, you know, my first slide was $180 million, just the numbers, 180,000,000. That was the only thing on the slide. And, you know, I just let that sit for 10 or 15 seconds, which seems like an eternity, you know. Anyways, and I said, all right, now that I've got your attention, let me tell you how we're going to get this. Because I had been in several of their plants and knew notionally where they were more or less and what additional capacity they had, what their gross profit was, and what their maintenance costs were. And, and what I found is in most operations, you have probably another 10% or more additional capacity in those assets that require 
little, maybe even no additional capital investment, and you have probably 10% or more additional opportunity to reduce your maintenance costs. So what's that worth? Now, that 10% is not through cost cutting. You know, any idiot can go in and shave 10% of the workforce off. But what are they doing to make sure that that doesn't impact the other 90% to the detriment of the entire organization? And so, you know, and the fundamental focus is uh, so-called defect elimination. Some people call it process improvement. You know, doesn't really matter what you call it, but what you're trying to do is make sure you eliminate the faults in the system that result in loss production or extraordinary costs. And so that's at that level. Now, at the shop floor level, what do they care about? Well, what they really care about is how you're going to make my life easier. You know, I come into work and I got all these obstacles. I can't get the parts. I can't, the procedures are screwed up. You know, they won't let me have the equipment. You know, and they know more about what the issues are than the guy that's running the site. So a lot of time I spend just with the guys on the floor. You know, I, I have this uh, phrase I use. If you want to understand the problems with the work, talk to the workers. I mean, what a simple concept, you know, but, but too many people don't use it. And maybe later, I know you've got one section you're mapped out where we might, I might tell you a little anecdote or two about just that, just Go talk to the guys doing the work, and they'll tell you what's wrong. And then, then I go back to the site manager, and he thinks I'm a genius. I'm not a genius. I just know who to talk to. I think that just that 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 go, brings up my next question that you had, Ron. Where it was it was it was a great ad where you talked about people aren't going to buy into it unless it's making their life easier. You know, right. and, and when we talk about the keys to success when it comes to manufacturers and how they implement maintenance and reliability solutions, you know, one of them we had on a mention here was the production and the maintenance partnership. And right. I think from that, that's the individual levels that are working on the equipment every single day. They're, they have their hands in the equipment, but there's also an, a level of, um, executive, I guess there's, there's three things, executive sponsorship, there's a production and the maintenance partnership, and then there's also the shop floor engagement. Can you dive more right. into I guess the other discussions that the, the other segments that you want to talk about with that. Yeah, sure. The, the executive sponsorship, now I use the phrase sponsorship to differentiate it from management or the leadership or whatever it may be. And, and those are concepts that, you know, I could talk about for a while, but the, the point about sponsorship is this. If, if I'm an executive, I can't just come to you, Jake and say, okay, reliability. I want some, here's some money, go find it. And then walk away, you know, check that box and walk away. It requires active engagement in the process. It requires me to come to you and participate in all the activities that you've got ongoing to demonstrate my support. It requires me treating it kind of very much the same as I would treat safety. Right now, if we had somebody seriously injured, I would be involved personally. Well, if you don't have good reliability, you're going to have more of that. I've got the data. You know, the, the poorer your reliability, the greater the risk to safety, injuries, you know, environment, and to major accidents. And so unless you have that sponsorship where there's an active, you know, engagement in demanding, supporting, rewarding, punishing, you know, expecting these things to happen, then it gets less emphasis, okay? Now, the production maintenance, maintenance partnership is one where, for example, the production manager and the maintenance manager are both held accountable for production schedule compliance, maintenance schedule compliance, and maintenance and repair costs. Because in most of these plants, too often, production blames maintenance for the failures. Maintenance blames production for not letting them have the equipment or running it into the ground. Well, if I hold you both 
accountable for both of those things with production in the lead, production has the lead, I want to emphasize that point, then you have to do what? Well, you have to work together to address the issues and come to a, you know, a common conclusion about what's the right thing to do for the business as opposed to my department. And when you have that along with a shop floor engagement process, you're far more likely to be successful. But if you don't have that, you know, that ex executive sponsorship, if you don't have the production maintenance partnership, either formally written or informal, and if you don't have that shop floor engagement process, it's not going to happen for you. I'll guarantee it. So, you know, folks tend to act autonomously in their little department, and some of that's necessary. It's essential, right? You've you got things you do independent of the other guy, but when you have task interdependence, then you have to work together for the greater good of the organization, deferring to doing the right thing for the company as opposed to your little patch. So those, you know, whatever I said, three or four things become an essential part of a proper reliability and OPEX program. Awesome. Yeah. So this has turned into a masterclass for all those who have a project that they need to get going in their company. How do you actually articulate these issues and what the solution is? Right. So thank you for, for that, Ron. That, that was a uh, really good points there. But now to transition into our next segment, uh, let's talk more about you and how you excel. And uh, I would like to hear about what's in your toolkit. We're going to fix it. Get the tool. Pick the one right tool. The right tool for the right job. All right. So now with all of this experience and this knowledge that you have, it only makes sense that you wrote about it, right? So can you talk about uh, your books and things? And for the audience, he is a published author. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, well, I've written six books, five of which apply to reliability, operational excellence. Uh, the most popular one is the first one. It was written, I think the first edition came out in 1999. So it's been around for 25 years, and it's now in its sixth edition. And it's called Making Common Sense, Common Practice. And, you know, most of what's in the book is literally what you might call common sense. But far too often, or more often than not, it's not common practice. And so what I tried to do in the book is take a fictitious company and describe some of my experience in working with various and sundry companies. It just kind of glommed them into a single company and address issues around leadership, alignment, uh, managing cultural change, you know, performance measures, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then address particular topics, design practices, procurement practices, you know, stores practices, installation startup practices, operating practices, and of course, maintenance practices. And then throw in there some of the common tools like RCM, TPM, maintenance planning and scheduling, and, and use that fictitious company to describe some of my experiences in working with, well, literally hundreds of companies out there and give folks case studies so they can relate to, you know, to a case study far more they, than they can relate to me uh, yammering on about one thing or another. And that one is, well, it's been around a long time. Um, of course, if it's a good book and popular, you have to write a sequel, right? So, so I wrote a sequel. You know, it's called What Tool When? You know, what tool should you use and when should you use it? And it kind of provides a hierarchy and covers all the more common and you know, popular tools. Now, with that said, though, my experience has been if you have good leadership, good alignment, good teamwork, partnerships, and good shop floor engagement, it doesn't matter what tool you use you'll figure out how to make it work for you. If you don't have good leadership, alignment, 
you know, teamwork and so on, uh, doesn't matter what tool you use. It's not going to work. So key to any effective organization of those things that we alluded or talked about earlier, and that is the executive sponsorship, the sense of working collectively to a common purpose, the alignment, the culture, and so on. So it's those kinds of things that really matter the most. Anyways, from there, I wrote a book, you know, where do we start our improvement program? That's uh, touched on in making common sense, common practice. And I wrote another book of a common sense approach to defect elimination. And it's a bunch of case studies that talk about some real simple things you can do to address the defects and, and have a better performance. And then uh, I wrote book called Business Fables and Foibles, and that's 35 short stories about the screw-ups I've seen people make in plants around the world that were just so obvious. You know, once you see the mistake, can you go, oh, why did I do that for? I don't know. You did it. So that, that one's more of a beach read. You know, the first two books, The Common Sense and the What Tools, When, those are, well, you got to want to read those, okay? They're not so, easy reads. So, so Ron, with, with one of the discussion points that you had in those books, you talked about how um, within maintenance, that maintenance is maybe too heavily emphasized compared to reliability and yep. how maybe it's one of those things that we should be focusing on more on the reliability of our equipment and our processes and our products more than the maintenance of them. Can you, can you dive more into that? Well, I mean, certainly I agree with that because by the time, you know, maintenance gets the equipment, everything's already been predetermined. I mean, the reliability has been preordained before they even get it. You know, if, if I'm designing something and I select, you know, poor efficiency motors, poor efficiency pumps, you know, use uh, carbon steel instead of stainless steel, because it's cheap and it's easy to get in, then eh, the maintenance guys are at a serious disadvantage. Or if when I'm buying stuff, I buy for price instead of performance or so-called total cost of ownership. Or if the storeroom is it is a, an afterthought, you know, a, as they say, you know, a redheaded stepchild or whatever the euphemism is, if it's not treated like a business, as it should be and run like a business, then the parts aren't going to be there. And so you're going to suffer more lost production. You're going to suffer increased maintenance costs because you don't have an effective storeroom with the right parts when folks need them. And of course, if you, you know, start things up, uh, if the procedures aren't well-defined, if they're not uh, well-trained and so on and so forth, then you're going to induce more defects. So it, it's all those things. I don't know. I've kind of touched on those earlier, but I don't know if I've answered your question or not. Oh, um, and you, you, you sorry, know, you got to have good maintenance okay. too. You know, good planning and scheduling, good condition monitoring and all that sort of thing. <laughs> maintenance gets a whole lot easier when you address all those things upstream and do a better job there. It, it's that, again, it's, it's that task interdependence that we need to assure is addressed so that we work collectively to a common purpose. And if you think about task interdependence, I mean, even in your business, right, who do you depend on to get things done so that you can be effective for your business? So it, it's that kind of mindset that you have to go at this with in order to be effective across the entire organization. Yeah, you've uh, you've raised some really good key points here, and, and uh, I'm sure our audience is really enjoying some of these topics as they highly impact our lives as maintenance professionals and as industrial professionals as well. Now, I do have a question, though. Would you be able to tell us maybe a fun story as you've literally written a book, as you just said, on stories in, uh, in this context? So would you be willing to share like maybe a short story uh, to kind of drive the point home, uh, anything that you think the audience would be interested in? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the one that came to mind when you, you know, asked that question was, I was at a steel mill 
And in fact, I'd been called by one of their senior folks to come up and, and do an RCM type analysis, you know, failure modes and effects and all that sort of thing. And I don't enjoy those. They're boring. They're tedious. So I called a friend of mine and I said, Bill, I've got a job for you, but I'll bring you up there and introduce you and so on. So we went to the site and we did a little bit of chit chat, you know, as you do. And I said, well, you know, before we do this RCM analysis, which takes several days and involves a lot of labor hours and, you know, I said, I want to go talk to the operator. Now, the, the, the machine or the process was a thing called a scarfer. I don't know if you know what a scarfer is, but it's a big box-shaped blowtorch. It's about three feet wide and about a foot and a half deep, and you slide slabs of steel through it. And it has burners every centimeter or so that literally burn, oxidize the top layer of uh, steel off of the steel. It's a quality control measure you use to minimize crack propagation into the steel. Anyways, go out to the operator of the scarfer, and I said, uh, you know, what, what's going on here? The people are complaining that it's not very reliable. Could you maybe describe that a little bit? And he said, well, we got a couple of problems. Uh, he said, one of them is the, uh, the burners, they heat up and they sag and they tend to damage things. And, uh, and that's because the cooling fluid, the filters aren't being changed often enough. So they overheat. Well, I mean, I'm no genius, but sounds like an easy fix to me. You know, let's change the filters more often or put a system on there to de detect the differential pressure across the filter and change it when it needs it. Okay, got that one. I said, what else? He said, well, the biggest one is they send me crooked steel. And it, you know, I've only got certain clearances in there. And it jams or rubs or bumps the scarfer and damages it. If they'd send me straight steel, we wouldn't have these problems. Okay. So I'll go up to the rolling mill operator. I said, what's the problem? You can't send them straight steel. And he says, well, uh, I got a little bit of a problem, he said, that when I get the slabs, they're cold on one side. So when I roll the steel, it curls a little bit, so I can't keep it straight. Huh, isn't that interesting? So go up to the ovens operator where they pre-treat the steel for the rolling process. And they said, what's the problem? You can't send him, you know, uniform temperature slabs so he can roll them. He said, well, the supervisor told me to leave the tops off the ovens. Cold air goes down the sides, and it cools them off. But he's told me i got to get my production up. Well, that's the only way I can do it. Okay. Now, I'm willing to, I didn't go see the site manager at that point, but I'm willing to bet you the site manager had told this guy, you better get your production up or I'm going to have your butt. Right? right? I'm willing yeah. to bet that. I, right. I never did confirm that. So, and I come across that. A lot. Okay. Wow. Where one area is functioning as if the other areas don't exist in order to get their area functioning higher. And then that the impact of that just kind of goes boom, 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 boom. Yep. Until at the very end, things are a mess. So, Ron, this, it's a good transition to move into, you know, our, our next segment, which is the future of factories. You know, it's where we cover new trends that you're seeing in the industry. Meet the future. To our futures. What future? The factory. My factory. Everybody's factory. I love your factory. My factory. My walls. With a lot of experience that you've had from, from going to these facilities and talking to these experts, I feel like there's there's a uh, a lot of new players in the field when it comes to new technology. So what do you think the industry should focus on when it comes to manufacturing and within maintenance or reliability like where where does ai where does recruiting how does bringing jobs back to the states where, where, can you add some insight onto what that would look like well um uh, as you may guess may have guessed already i'm not big into even though i ran a technology company so <laughs> when i did that i was more into helping people work together to a common purpose you know i had 
good engineers and good technicians and good software guys. I mean, they, they knew this stuff. They were just fantastic. And so the technology is out there, for example, AI, I think I have mixed feelings actually, you know, based on what little bit I know. It, it has the potential to be a dramatic, make dramatic improvements in productivity of the individuals because they skip through some mundane tasks that aren't really necessary. But it also has the potential to do great harm, you know, where people are using it, you know, bad actors are using it to influence folks in a negative way. Now, that's more on the political front. So from a technology standpoint, I think it has great potential from a political standpoint, I think really concerns me. I mean, it's already bad enough, all these social platforms spreading lies and misinformation and just stupid stuff. And now we got a tool that will amplify that. So that concerns me a great deal. Now, having said that, though, let's, you know, some of the other technology like condition monitoring and, you know, maintenance planning and scheduling systems, CMMSs and all that sort of thing. I think those are great tools. The problem that I see with those, though, is that people, well, use an analogy. Buying a CMMS and putting planners and schedulers in place and expecting that you're going to suddenly be a whole lot better is kind of like buying Word and handing it to folks and saying, here, write a novel. I gave you the tool. You know, what's wrong? So there has to be some sort of connection between the work the processes, the tools, and so on, so that you have an effective solution that uses the tool to enhance your productivity, uh, you know, by virtue of application of the tool. And in my view, uh, we spend a whole lot of time focused on technology and not nearly enough time focused on, you know, what some people call blocking and tackling, right? You getting the basic training of folks who know how to do the work and then give them the tool or train them in the use of the tool as opposed to saying, here's a tool, go figure out how to use it. So there's, there's some fundamental elements that are missing in most of these companies wherein, well, I sent you the training. You spent two days figuring it out, didn't you? Can't you use it? Well, no, is the short answer. You don't really understand how to use a tool until you've used it time and time and time again. And too often folks assume that just because you've been to a, a two-day or a week-long course, well, you're proficient now. Not even close. So that's, that's one of the issues. As far as uh, recruiting and you know, getting folks into the company, I'm a big fan of the Toyota approach, and that is you hire for aptitude and attitude. Okay. Because if you got those right, then we can teach you how to do what we want you to do. Our, our training and development systems are excellent. Our supervisory uh, staff has been there, done that. They know how to do it. And I'm going to give you a lot of hands-on skill development as opposed to staring at a bunch of, you know, what, PowerPoint slides. The, you know, tactile visual training is far more important and doing it in small doses, two to four hours. I teach you a little bit, have you do it. Teach you a little bit, have you do it, and so on. And when you do it that way, you're going to be far more successful at having the proper skills. And, and again, you know, doing the basic stuff. And all those tools are very often used as solutions, and they're not solutions. They're tools to help you apply these principles effectively within the organization. Anyways, I've preached to probably enough on that point. There was no uh, manufacturing, wasn't it? it? Was you wanted me to talk a little bit about that? You know, I I see manufacturing. You know, uh, Greenspan, I think he said original wealth comes from manufacturing, mining, and agriculture. Now we're mm -hmm. pretty good at mining and we're pretty good at agriculture if you just look at the productivity in those areas although mining well frankly it needs work okay but manufacturing our 
or manufacturing, I think, is an issue around national security, economic security, and for that matter, national defense security. Because if we're having to go particularly to folks like China for critical items, you know, like rare earth minerals, metals, wow, we're at incredible risk for that. Or if we're having to go to you know, the Middle East for oil and natural gas, whoa, or aluminum from, you know, some foreign country. And all that needs to happen is that those supply chains disrupted either by virtue of a political situation or by virtue of a military situation even. And, you know, we're at serious, serious risk. So I think there needs to be a, and chips, you know, didn't mention chips, you know, 90% of the chips, I'm told, I don't know the numbers, come from Taiwan. Well, think about that and the risk we're taking in not having our own chip factories here. So, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, improving our manufacturing base and our capabilities for not just for our economy, but also for our national security. And I think, I think personally that it's essential. Yeah, now, absolutely. Having said that, we, we still want to have good trade relations with all those folks, but we want to do it by virtue of, from a position of strength, not a position of weakness. And right now right. we got some areas where we're in a position of weakness. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, it's important to have these conversations. Uh, and look at this with a very sober lens, because as you mentioned, national security starts to become a big theme in this, right? So I, I really appreciate your words there. And then you, you also talked about, you know, the, the future of the different issues that we, uh, we're having to face here. So I r really appreciate that. Now, transitioning for, to the next section, which we call Fix It Funnies. I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about some different things here. Uh, but before we dive into that, uh, what do you feel, looking at all these different issues you mentioned, do you feel that these are insurmountable issues or do you see any that could be insurmountable? Uh, just to transition us over, I just wanted to ask you that quick question before we, we press on. Um, the, the short answer is they're not insurmountable, I don't think. The key issue in my mind is that is are the leaders of this country and the leaders of these large companies, or do they understand the importance of reliability, operational excellence, you know, strong manufacturing base, not just from their little patch perspective, of course they do, but from a perspective of the strategic importance it is to this country. And I, I think intellectually they do. Um, I'm just not sure that we've come to a proper political uh, solution to all that so that we think more broadly about our role in the world and, and how we fit in and, and the importance of our leadership in the world, you know, for manufacturing, technology, uh, you know, militarily, all that sort of thing. And it's a bit of a, right now we are in a bit of a conundrum because we have such a uh, strong diametrically opposed opinions and it, it's very it's very concerning to me okay so I'll, I'll on that note i'll pause and we can go on to something a little less weighty <laughs> yeah yeah for sure no that was all super appreciated uh very very important things but transitioning over to uh the fix it funnies the fix is in it's making a really funny noise i'm gonna fix it Make it funny would be great if you could make it funny. Your fate is fixed. So makes it funny. Make sure it's funny. Uh, at the start of the episode, Jake asked you where you like to escape and get your much needed vacations. So now on the other hand, I'd like to ask you about, do you have any sort of work hacks, right? Are you wearing specific insoles or do you, do you keep a power bar in your pocket at all times or a specific, uh, any sort of thing like that that would, uh, that would be entertaining for the for the uh, the audience to hear. Well, I, I don't know about entertaining, but it's just things that I do. I'm kind of OCD. Just ask my wife. You know, uh, <laughs> I 
I weigh myself every morning. As you know, as soon as I get up, I go to the bathroom. I come out and I weigh myself, and huh. I do that for. It's a real simple thing to do, but I do that because I don't. It's called short interval control process in process control. You know, real short intervals, so that you don't go through this excursion, right? Where you know you you don't look look for whatever a year, and you look down, and you go. Damn, what happened? I've gained 20 pounds. So, so it's just, you know, my way of saying, oh, I, I can't have pie tonight or something like that, just to keep things in control, you know. And another thing I do, I, and I started doing this decades ago, just after I got out of school, or maybe I was in school, I don't remember, is keeping a list, to-do list, and a to-call list. People I have to call, things I have to do, and there's a check mark out with each one. One check means, yeah, that's important. Two means, boy, you're late. And three means, man, you're screwed. You know, <laughs> it's too late. So, so, and then the ones that don't have a check mark, well, I, you'll keep checking those from day to day to add the check mark as needed. So it. You know, it's just something that keeps me organized and on track about doing what I need to do. And it's so handwritten, Brian, right? This is not on a phone or a computer. You know, it's, it's on a piece of paper. You know, I'm low tech in that regard. Yeah. So, Ron, if you were in this industry within manufacturing and maintenance and reliability, what industry would you have gone into? Yeah, I'd probably be a doctor. Because that's that's just something that appealed to me in my younger years. But as I got a little older, I started, you know, looking at other opportunities and so on. And and the funny thing is, the initial plan was, yeah, to be a doctor back when I was, you know, just young in high school even. And I thought, man, that's going to take seven years or more, right, to go through residency. And I thought, I don't want to wait that long. Well, guess what? It took me seven years to get my BS. <laughs> so, so I probably could have, should have, would have been a doctor, but here we are now. And it, you know, as they say, it worked out. I, you know, what do you do when, you know, things don't go like you've planned? Well, you adapt and adjust and move on. And so that's, that's what I've done. And so far it's worked out and I'm getting old, so. You know, I reckon it will work out as we continue forward. Well, Ron, to a degree, you did become a doctor, but just a doctor for manufacturers, right? right. <laughs> so, well, by so, the way, that, so that sixth, sorry, that sixth book that I wrote was about my mm -hmm. wife's liver transplant. You know, wow. it was all the lessons learned as huh. a part of helping her, you know, pre-transplant during transplant and post-transplant. So I picked up a lot about the medical profession as a part of doing that. And some some of them don't really appreciate my comments because I'm looking for defects, right? And they don't appreciate me pointing them out to them. But anyways, there's a book. I wrote a book about it. You know, sorry, but you know, <laughs> interrupted you no. there. Go ahead. No, I appreciate that. I'm actually going to check it out. Oh, so, so yeah, no worries there. Now, one question I do have for you. Are you enjoying any particular pieces of content, whether it be TV shows, radio shows, uh, podcasts, uh, anything of that nature that you would like to talk about briefly to the audience? Well, I don't care much for the drivel on TV. I like PBS and Nature and Nova and, you know, those things. I like, uh, what else do I like? I don't know. Those are the things I do like and I enjoy. I like basketball, although my team just. <laughs> I'm a big Kentucky fan, okay? And three years running now, they've underperformed. So I'm really irritated right now about that. Yeah, you, I'm and, sure. Yeah, the watching watching March Madness uh, this time this year was probably not a fun time for you at all. No, nah, it was awful. But you know, you get over it, move on. You know, 
<laughs> yeah. So I guess one, one final question for you. Um, if you were to work on a unique piece of machinery or equipment, you know, what would you, what would you like to work on? If you could work on anything, do maintenance, design anything in the world, what would it be? Well, uh, actually my first car was a 1950 Pontiac with a straight flathead eight and the spark plugs went into the top of the engine. You know, I would actually kind of like to go back and work on something like that because it's simple. It's easy. It's something I can do, you know, without a lot of, uh, training on electronics and so on. You know, it had an oil bath air filter. It had yeah. a, you know, a generator, not an alternator. And everything was right there. It was easy. Even I could work on it. So, you know, it's probably something like that, you know. Now, that's not a big complex machine like a compressor or, you know, a big uh, enormous turbine or anything like that. But, you know, I tend to lean towards simple stuff that's easy to do, that's enjoyable to, to do. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Ron, thanks again for coming to the show. It was great to have you. And also, by the way, thank you for your service as well. This has been The Maintainers, a Blue Cap Community podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe wherever you consume your podcast as we are on most major platforms. So you will be able to be notified the next time we have an episode going live. This podcast is brought to you by Traction. Traction offers streamlined hardware and software solutions designed to make maintenance more reliable and profitable. Their AI-powered condition monitoring and asset management solution predicts machine failures and eliminates unplanned downtime, generating an average of 38% more productivity for clients worldwide. It's artificial intelligence quarterbacking your maintenance.